Hej och varmt välkomna allihopa Hej Rickard Till den här föreläsningen av professor Roger Scruton Jag ska ge ett introduktionstal Som jag av respekt för Mr. professor Scruton Kommer att ge på engelska För första gången i mitt liv Så ni får söka ha överseende med mitt uttal Most honored guests Ladies and gentlemen Dear friends of Sweden During my almost 40 years on this earth, I have been given the opportunity to meet many important and famous people. I have dined with the Swedish royal family. I have met many prominent political leaders all over the world, including a former American president. I have also met many actors, artists, and several of my favorite rock groups. But I must admit that I had never before been so starstruck as I am today when I'm standing here before you with the privileged task to introduce to you the Honorable Professor Roger Scruton. <laughs> Many European conservatives and academics consider Professor Roger Scruton to be one of the most prominent conservative thinkers of modern times. Personally, I think they are wrong. In my opinion, uh, Professor Scruton are one of the most prominent conservative thinkers of all times. As if it wasn't enough to be one of the greatest conservative philosophers of all time, Professor Scruton also possesses a work ethic and a productivity that could make even the strictest, most hardworking Calvinist feel like a slacker. <laughs> Professor Scruton has for over three decades taught at institutions on both sides of the Atlantic, including Birkbeck College, Boston University, and more recently at the University of Buckingham. He has written several operas, and he is an author of more than 40 books. Last year, he published three books, all of which were chosen among People's Books of the Year. He is also a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and the British Academy. Professor Scruton is not only an author and a man of words. More importantly, he is also a man of his words. A brave man that has shown that he is ready to take action and even risk his own life for what he believes in. During that dark age in human history, when large parts of the world and large parts of Europe were suffering under communist tyranny, Professor Scruton took active part in the fight to overthrow the Red Tyrants. He did this by aiding dissidents and by smuggling forbidden books and forbidden scriptures behind the Iron Curtain into Eastern Europe. Because of this, he got detained and thrown out of the country by the communist regime in Czechoslovakia, and he got followed by the communist secret police in Poland and Hungary. Later, when the communist dictatorships finally had fallen, he was awarded the Czech Republic's first class medal of merit by the conservative president, Václav Klaus, for his efforts and for his bravery. I am aware that there are some differences between the Swedish social conservatism of the Sweden Democrats and the British traditionalist conservatism of, Mr. of Professor Roger Scruton. This is not a problem, though. On the contrary, as Professor Scruton has so wisely has pointed out, it is rather natural and even a desirable thing for conservatives of different countries to be different. In his book, The Meaning of Conservatism, Professor Scruton writes, Quote, Conservatism must necessarily take many forms. Solon, when asked what is the best form of government, replied, for whom and at what time. It is a particular country, a particular history, a particular form of life that commands the conservatives' respect and energy. End of quote. Subsequently, it matters not if we may have some different views on, for example, the size of the welfare state, I have no intention to meddle in the economic decisions of the British people, and I'm pretty sure that Professor Scruton has no ambition to run for the post as Minister of Finance in Sweden, even though, of course, it would be a great leap forward for us if he should decide to do so. <clears throat> Levels of taxation may be important, but it is not 
one of the great issues where the conservatives of the West need to unite. It is not one of the great issues that will impact the future stability of our continent. It is not one of the great issues that will decide the fate of our civilization and our freedom. It is not one of the great issues that will decide the identity and the security of my children and my future grandchildren. There are, however, several such great issues and urgent issues that we have to deal with. And for decades, Professor Scruton has been a leading figure and an inspiration to others in the fight against the destructive forces on these issues. For decades, he has been fighting on our side, defending dear and indispensable things such as national sovereignty, freedom, identity, cultural heritage, traditions, security, family, home, community, virtue, and beauty. For this, he has won my deepest respect and gratitude, and I cannot thank him enough. I hope you thank him, though, by giving him the warmest possible applaud. The stage is yours, Professor Scruton. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that most kind introduction. Uh, I think there, there may be some Swedish version of my talk to, about to be projected on the screen, is that right? To, so that you should be able to follow my words in your own language. Uh, I'm so impressed, of course, by the fact that uh, Swedes know my language probably as well as I do. Uh, at least um, I know that most of you in this room will be able to follow directly many of my sentiments. So thank you first for the invitation to address you and secondly, for reaching out in this way to your British friends and colleagues. As you know, I speak as a conservative, someone who belongs to a tradition of political thought that has shaped the institutions and habits of my country and also of many other countries in the Anglosphere, including America. I, I am aware that I'm speaking in a country where the word conservative does not have the same resonance as it does for us. Sweden is famous for its continuous tradition of social democracy, meaning a kind of mild socialism in which the state takes charge of society and older forms of social order, such as religion and family, are marginalized. However, it does not follow that Swedes are not open to the conservative message nor does it follow that we cannot form sensible alliances for the protection of our shared inheritance. And that is what I want to talk about. A conservative is someone who wants to conserve what is valuable in the face of internal and external threats to it. In the post-war period, when I was growing up, the threats were two. The external threat posed by the Soviet Union and the internal threat posed by aggressive socialism. The two threats went together, at least in my country. Those advocating a socialist economy were also, for the most part, advocating disarmament in the face of the Soviet belligerence. And this complex of attitudes existed right through to the days of Margaret Thatcher and beyond. People on the left in my country were seldom able to take the threat from the Soviet Union seriously. After all, the Soviet Union was a socialist country, seriously committed to the cause of social equality. And British leftists regarded capitalism as the principal enemy, meaning not just the economy of private enterprise, but all the institutions that had grown around it, from the family and the legal system to the established Christian church. Now, I don't doubt that something similar was true here in Sweden. People on the left were proud of Sweden's neutral status outside the NATO alliance. And indeed, many Swedes, even those of a more conservative persuasion, have endorsed the country's neutral stance, though for other reasons more connected with patriotism than with socialist sympathies. Those on the left regarded the principal enemy in the same terms as British socialists, 
namely as the capitalist economy, the institutions, the class system, and the social traditions that Sweden had inherited and that had made Sweden the country that it is. Over the years, I've come to believe that this is the character of the left in every place where it has a following. It has one overarching positive value, which is equality. But its politics is almost entirely negative, advocating the destruction of distinction in all its forms. It is against hierarchies, against traditional family values, against all the ways in which people try to live up to their heritage or to feel proud of what they have achieved. It advocates a kind of politics of repudiation, a systematic jettisoning of patriotism and national loyalty, since these are offenses to the idea of equality. And of course, the history of modern Europe adds a useful propaganda message to reinforce this kind of politics. Our history books have been rewritten to tell us that nationalism has been the cause of our European wars and that the path forward is the benign path forged by the socialist state, which makes no distinctions and acts as a benevolent distributive machine. This soft left vision has been programmed into the institutions of the European Union. For 60 years, the European Commission has promoted the gradual dismantling of national borders and national sovereignty and their replacement by a benign bureaucracy devoted to the equal rights of European citizens, regardless of all the distinctions that have been noticed or emphasized in the past. At the same time, traditional sources of authority, church, family, nation, parliaments, and the military have been marginalized. As a result, the European people now find themselves face to face with a situation with which they do not know how to deal. Migrants from the Middle East, Asia, and Africa, many of whom have little or no knowledge of the European tradition of civil order and open dealings, have flooded across our borders and no national government has the will or the real legal authority to exclude them. We should not discount the responsibility of the left for this situation. From the first trickle of asylum seekers in the 1960s, politicians and activists on the left have been assiduous in preventing the discussion of whether their arrival should be welcomed. Anybody who raised the question, how many, or what kind, would be instantly accused of racism, a term which, once applied, had a poisonous effect on the career or social standing of the target. After all, racism was the great evil that caused the Holocaust, and which was the indigenous sin of the European peoples, for which they must forever apologize. Thus it was in my country, and thus it was, no doubt, here in Sweden too. As a result, a kind of censorship prevails for all the years in which the immigrant populations grew, and nobody could question either the policy of admitting them or their behavior once installed without putting his own career at risk. At many moments, it was in my country as though the left stood for no other policy than anti-racism. And as our inner city schools filled with children who neither spoke the language of the teacher nor understood his way of life. The sole policy advocated on the left was to silence those who wondered whether this was a good thing for the future of the nation. I know that this has been your situation here too, and that many disturbing matters have been rendered undiscussable by the tendency on the left to direct all criticism to us, the Swedes, the unwilling hosts, and at all costs to avoid any criticism of them, the incomers, those who are taking advantage of a legal, political, and economic system that they in fact did nothing to create, and who may show scant loyalty to its basic principles. Residents of Malmö will recognize what vulnerable young girls in our northern cities have, in Britain have had to go through on account of a police force which cannot protect them from sexual predation when the predators are from immigrant communities, since to do so is to invite the charge of racism. The amazing scandal of Rotherham is only one of several, and probably you have read about it. 
There are deep problems here which have to do with what has been called the clash of civilizations. We are beginning to understand that communities cannot be simply transferred from one place to another on the planet and expected to obey the customs and laws of the place where they arrive. In particular, rural Muslim communities, whose conception of law is entirely founded in religious precepts and who think of women as the property, either of a father or a husband, have great difficulty in accepting the assumptions on which Western societies are based. They cannot easily accept the secular law. They deny the autonomy of women, and they believe that women who have strayed from the path of purity are legitimate targets of sexual predation. In the circumstances from which these people come, in rural Afghanistan and elsewhere, there may be something to be said in justification of those attitudes. But they have no place here, since they strike at the heart of what we are. Our societies did not achieve secular law, freedom of religion, the rights of women, and open dealings between the sexes without a great effort. The drama is written all over Swedish art and literature, from Strindberg to Ingmar Bergman. And Swedes are surely right to be proud of the result. From its Lutheran heritage, Sweden has received the gift of the individual conscience, the view that each person is responsible for himself and accountable to others. This country, like ours, is based on an idea of responsible citizenship in which people are bound together by man-made laws so as to respect differences of religion and family customs. It is precisely for this reason that Sweden, like Britain, has an immigration problem. Who would want to immigrate into a place where differences of religion and custom are not respected? A place where you have at once to submit to a way of, way of life that is foreign to you. That is why no Muslim country in the whole world has an immigration problem, and also why the majority of the world's migrants are fleeing from places where Islam is the prevailing faith. The great question confronting us, both you here in Sweden and us in Britain, is what our policy should be now, when we have accepted many more immigrants than our indigenous people wanted and have in many cases failed to integrate them. What should be our policy and how should it be presented to the people? I think about this constantly, as we all do, and I know that it is far more difficult than it seems. But the situation is not, I think, hopeless. Of course, there is a worst-case scenario, which is social breakdown and war between the communities of a kind that prevails in the Middle East and elsewhere. I don't doubt that this could happen. But any coherent policy must be designed to prevent it happening, and it must begin from a position of affirmation. It must be founded in positive belief, belief in Sweden and its heritage, and in the need to defend that heritage against internal and external threat. And it must be realistic, not based on wishful thinking or sentimental, sentimental illusions, either about immigrant communities or about the indigenous community of Sweden. The importance of affirmation should not be underestimated. Not Sweden only, but the whole of Europe is going through a crisis of identity at the moment, and one cause of this is that people have been forbidden to affirm what they are. As soon as they try to do so, they are accused of racism and xenophobia. Uh, and that's the official language of the European Union institutions. Nevertheless, we must recognize that all across Europe, there is a question in the hearts of ordinary people. Namely, where is my country? In France, this is very evident. The French want their country back. They want to affirm its identity, its culture, and its standing against a political process that seems to be wiping its face from the map. People in Britain are beginning to feel the same as are the Italians and the Spaniards. And there is nothing in the European institutions that can answer to their anxieties. Ordinary Swedes believe in Sweden in the same way that ordinary Frenchmen believe in France. In this climate, it is not an aggressive belief. It is more like a sense of belonging. This country, this landscape, this way of life, Swedes believe, are ours. It is our starting point, 
the home from which we begin and to which we return. That is the most fundamental aspect of all ordinary political loyalties. There need be nothing aggressive about it. You can think in this way without wanting to exclude the incomer, the immigrant, the one who comes in search of hospitality. But if you do think in this way, then you also believe that the newcomer has to accept the norms and customs that make the country what it is. That means speaking the language, respecting the institutions and the laws, and accepting a certain public culture. This public culture is one of the most important features of Western societies, and it is part of what makes democracy possible. Culture, for us, is not a private thing. Of course, it has private aspects. For the most part, we do not make a display of our religious beliefs or our private eccentricities. Far more, far more important than those private things, however, has been the need to live in peace with our neighbors. And this means accepting a certain way of being in the public square. We confront each other as strangers, come face to face in order to resolve our conflicts. We hope to settle conflicts by agreement, including the agreement to differ. And we respect opinions that are not our own. Our public culture is one of discussion with a certain measure of skepticism. We expect conformity to the broad principles of legal and moral order and to the language in which those things are discussed. This public culture of the Western democracies is something to be treasured. It is the thing that makes democracy possible. How else can we live, as we do live, ruled by people whose opinions we reject? That is certainly true of the Sweden Democrats. We accept to be governed by those whom we did not vote for, largely because we know that they share with us the ground rules of the democratic culture. They respect disagreement. They have renounced force. They have accepted to privatize religion, family, tribe, and the darker side of their commitments. They acknowledge the legitimacy of discussion and free opinion. They know that they live in a society of strangers who nevertheless meet each other face to face and enjoy all the fruits of free cooperation. None of that is possible without a certain measure of love for the country, its history, climate, landscape, institutions, and laws. It is this love that the Eurocrats wish to take away from us and which the newcomers have yet to learn. But it is the thing that we must at all costs affirm. Nowhere in the world has democracy taken root without the love of country as the soil in which it has been planted. You don't have to be a belligerent Swedish nationalist to accept this. You have merely to acknowledge that when you speak of, of Sweden, you speak in the first person plural. You speak of us, of our country, of our way of life. And you acknowledge that this is the most important thing that you share with your neighbors, the thing that makes it possible to live peacefully side by side, whatever your disagreements. It is therefore the thing that you must affirm, the sine qua non without which there is no such place as Sweden. I read recently of an interesting case here. Two communities from neighboring villages in Iraq, one Armenian Orthodox, the other Sunni Muslim, had managed to settle in Stockholm, and the leading family of the first community had established a successful restaurant in the city but the premises were constantly vandalized by their former Sunni neighbors, and on the doors and windows were written in Arabic the slogan, convert or die. Here is a vivid illustration of what I mean by a shared public culture, the way of life that makes such behavior inconceivable. In a smaller way, the habit of Sunni communities of veiling their women in public is a similar offense to the public culture of a Western democracy. It amounts to a refusal to accept that here, in this place, people are face to face with strangers, that the private realm does not intrude into the public, and that we live by open discussion and free disagreement. I mention those small examples because they illustrate a bigger problem. If we are to affirm what we are, we must also be prepared to reject what does not belong to what we are. That means rejecting customs and ways of life that are explicitly offensive to our public culture. We have been redu reluctant to do this, though we should give credit to the French for banning the full face veil in public. 
We have been especially reluctant to take action against Muslim men who do not accept the public attitude to women in our societies and who believe that they are entitled to abuse any woman who enters the public sphere of free negotiation, unprotected by a family member. It is at this point that we need some kind of positive affirmation of our public culture. We need to say to any immigrant who abuses women in the way that is familiar all across Europe, you don't belong here. And having said this, we should act on it. We should be actively looking for ways to expel those who have no respect for the place where they have settled or for the culture that prevails here. This affirmation of what we are should not be dismissed as nationalism or xenophobia. It is not a form of hostility to others, but on the contrary, an affirmation of what we have, which is a way of easily accepting others. As the restaurant case illustrates, acceptance of the other and of the otherness of the other is precisely what is missing from so much of Middle Eastern society and one deep cause of the conflicts that prevail there. It is also a prevailing weakness, in my view, in Sunni Islam. Our public culture is one in which the other is accepted. It is a culture of otherness, if you like, and what makes this possible is the face-to-face -face negotiations that take us unpredictably through our days. We should not be ashamed of this. On the contrary, we should affirm it, take pride in it, and recognize that what makes this culture possible is our shared attachment to a country, its traditions, and its way of life. I believe that this should be, in general, the message of center-right parties all across Europe. The message should be an affirmation of patriotism, of loyalty to a shared inheritance and a way of being associated with the country, its institutions, and its laws. Working on this, finding the areas in which people will respond affirmatively to the Swedish experience could be an important part of your work on behalf of Swedish democracy. I belong to a generation that acquired a distinctive view of Sweden from Strindberg and Ingmar Bergman. We knew the country as a melancholy, introspective place in which self-questioning souls flourished in lonely landscapes of birch trees and lakes. Younger people today have no such image, and probably many of them see the soul of Sweden as captured more accurately by your notorious death metal groups, such as Meshuggah. But I am sure that ordinary, everyday Swedishness has little or nothing to do with either of those icons, and to explore it and affirm it must surely be part of your mission. The great question, who are we, should be put confidently at the top of the agenda. What, though, should be done about the migration problem? As I have said, nothing can be done if the first step is not taken, and that first step is one of affirmation. You must say, here is what we are and what we have. This is what we are going to hold on to, and this is what we are going to defend against any incursion from outside. Only if that first step is taken will the people have the courage and resolution to take the next step, which is to take control of their national borders. The European Union, in its foolishness, has tried to dissolve national borders, but without but without putting in place any method of protecting its own outer perimeter. As a result, it has exposed the nation states of Europe to uncontrolled invasion. It has to be part of the policy of any center-right party in Europe to repossess the borders and to impose stringent controls on who enters the country and for what reason. It will be difficult, but it has to be done as we now recognize in Britain. It will mean making a real distinction between a refugee and an economic migrant, between someone seeking asylum and someone merely seeking a better life. And it will have to be enforced both negatively and positively. As well as offering asylum, it is necessary also to withdraw it. It is necessary to defy the well-meaning leftists who will not allow you to expel from your country those who have come here merely to exploit it in a criminal way. Being tough on the exploiters is a vital part of being kind to the others. The third step is surely to bring an end to the lies. What we know in Britain and America as political correctness has made it impossible to describe the problem that we are now confronting in any way that makes proper sense of it. 
A veil of sentimentality and half-truth is drawn across the whole issue so that people re retreat from it into a private world of their own and try to pretend that it is not their problem. Western democracies are founded on open discussion. It is what has enabled us to solve our problems in the past and should help us to solve our problems now. But in the crucial matter that confronts us, open discussion is all but forbidden. The statistics concerning rapes of indigenous Swedish women by immigrants are concealed from you. The facts about the origins and beliefs of the newcomers are passed over as though irrelevant. The fact that so many of them are single men who come without women, leaving their families behind, emerges only when statisticians look with alarm at the imbalance between male and female in the Swedish population. In the face of all this, it is necessary now to say, enough of hypocrisy, it is time to take Sweden and its future seriously. Only then will it be possible to address the question of where the country is going. This brings me to the fourth and final step that in my view is required if you are to address the problem, which is that of making citizens out of those who come here, often from countries like Afghanistan, which have no real conception of citizenship, since in such places membership is based on tribe or faith rather than political obedience. For a long time, people on the left have advocated a multicultural approach in schools and public institutions, believing that, that this is the way to respect difference and to avoid discrimination. In my view, that idea is both naive in itself and also imbued with the same anti-patriotism which has threatened European stability in recent decades. Integration, in my view, means integration into a shared public culture. It means teaching newcomers that religion belongs in the private sphere that the secular law takes precedence over religious law in any matter where they seem to conflict, that women and men are equal participants in the public arena, and that this country is Sweden, which is founded in a public culture of its own. The child of immigrants should emerge from the education system as a Swede, just as the child of immigrants emerges from the American immersion experience as an American. Curriculum, sport, extracurricular activities and social life should be presented to the newcomers in exactly the same way as they are presented to any other child in the classroom. The whole idea of a multicultural society should be simply dropped from the agenda as a leftist delusion. And this means that a truly democratic party must embark on extensive educational reforms. In Britain, it should be said, Hindus and Sikhs have had no difficulty in accepting such an idea of integration, long familiar to us from the 19th century integration of Catholics, Gypsies, and Jews. Only Muslims have had a problem, due to the belief among Sunnis especially, that the Quran lays down a complete law for life in the world, and that this law takes precedence over all competitors, including the law of the sovereign state. Combating that delusory belief should be part of our efforts. We need a full and open discussion of the nature of the Quran, its status as a guide to life, and the ways in which its edicts might be qualified for the benefit of our fellow citizens who do not believe in it. Can this be done? I believe it can, and that the history of the Ottoman Empire and its successors presents us with encouraging precedents. But the real problem is that, because of political correctness, nobody seems willing to discuss the point. I have given you my four-step four method for dealing with the migration problem. It is a demanding method, and of course it won't solve every problem, not least the problem of the male-female balance in your society. But it will give hope to ordinary voters and ensure that your party will be, as it deserves to be, the party of government. Thank you.